for the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with the Lord's prayer here. We'll continue this morning finishing up as he prays, prays for believers in John 17, 20, after we go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we could come this morning to your house. And I thank you that we have your word. It's been preserved so well for us over all these years, and your word is truth. I ask that you would bless this word, have your Holy Spirit enlighten it for us. And as we read from it this morning, may it penetrate our hearts and open our spiritual eyes. As we celebrate this Christmas season, Father, we think of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at this portion of the prayer, we see how much he loves us here today. 2,000 years ago, even before the cross, he's praying for the believers that would come, that would follow, that would be with him in this world. So Father, open our spiritual ears, hearts, and eyes this morning that we may see these great truths. And I pray as always in that glorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus continues his prayer here in John 17, 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they might be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast seen me. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved them as Thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom Thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which Thou hast given me. For Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee, but I have known Thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. As I said over the past two Sundays, we've looked at the Lord's Prayer here. It's recorded for us in John 17. And we approach the final portion of this prayer. We're looking at the future believers. Jesus is directing this prayer to us, future believers. And we will come to salvation through their word. Whose word? The witness of the apostles. The ministry, the preaching, the teaching, the miracles they performed in helping to start that early church. There are four distinct requests Jesus makes for the believers here. The church. When we talk about believers, we're talking about the church. You're the church, I'm the church. This is a building. We call it going to church. We call it the church. We're the church. This is just a meeting place. And so when he's talking about future believers, the church, he's talking about us. Jesus, We were on his mind 2,000 years ago with the cross facing him. He's still praying for us. There are four things that he talks about for us. Our protection, our sanctification, our unity, and participation in His glory. You may not realize it, but in this dispensation of grace, some people call it the church age, but the dispensation of grace actually extends beyond the church. Did you know that? The church age will end with the rapture. When we go up, the church is gone. Those people who come to salvation during the tribulation are not church saints. They're tribulation saints, but they're still during the dispensation of grace. This dispensation will last until the Lord sets up His kingdom. Well, that be the dispensation of the kingdom, which is the seventh dispensation. Interesting. Seven, the number of perfection or completion. 
But in this dispensation of grace, every believer who has come to Jesus Christ has come to him directly or indirectly through the apostles' witness. As we look back at our life, we think of the Sunday school teachers and the pastors and those people who have witnessed to us over the years. But you know, it's the apostles who are still witnessing to us today. Those men boldly, through the power of the Holy Spirit, took the gospel message into the world. And it was the Holy Spirit who inspired them to those men to record in writing the books of the New Testament. They're still witnessing us in these New Testament books. In the pages of the gospel accounts, in the history of the church, in the letters, in the prophecy of Revelation, we hear the truth of God's Word. We are still hearing directly from God through the apostles. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? And I want you to know and take what I'm about to tell you to heart. Jesus Christ is totally God. And He knew His mission was going to succeed. He knew it because He's God. Jesus knew He would die on the cross for the sin of the world. He knew He was going to be raised again. Jesus promised His disciple He would send them a comforter. He promised them and it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when He came. And with the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus knew that His apostles would preach the Word, they would clearly present the Gospel message, and as a result, people all over the Roman Empire, the world of the time, would be converted and the church was formed. Let me say this right here and now. No matter how small your local church might be, and I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the Baptist churches are small like we are. The first church was made up of 12 people. 12 people. And what did they do? We're still here 2,000 years later. We're still here. 12 people. With the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction, the protection of God, the message went out. The church grew by leaps and bounds when the gospel was presented, not because of the apostles' power, not in their strength, not in their ability, but because, as Isaiah 55, 11 tells us, and so shall thy word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish what, that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Jesus said, you go out there and you preach the gospel to the world. You give them my word and it came back. It was completed. Over in Hebrews 4, 12. I always think of my brother Bob Penrod here. He used this verse so often. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrows, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the word of God. That's what the apostles took into the world. And that's what we have to continue to take into the world today. That's why it's the utmost importance that we study the Bible, Old Testament and New we need to study the entire Bible because when we study the entire Bible, we find in the Old Testament that there are types and shadows and prophecies that enable us to better comprehend what's written for us in the New Testament. If you take the Old Testament and push it away, you will never understand the New Testament. I had a Sunday school teacher one time tell me, oh, about 10 or 11, we don't need the Old Testament. It's old. It's finished. It's complete. I knew that was a lie then. If I didn't understand the old, how would I comprehend the new? Because keep in mind, in the old concealed, in the new revealed. The Word of God is true from beginning to end. Just because we're not under the dispensation of law anymore doesn't change God's Word. I want to tell you an example of this is found over in Exodus chapter 28 where we see the <coughs> high priest of Israel carry the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were engraved on stones and they were placed on his breastplate. And by doing that, when he entered into the tabernacle, later into the temple, he was carrying the entire nation of Israel before God. Now in Hebrews, we find out that our Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And you know what? 
At this point, he's saying, I'm going to carry the future believers with me when I go to God. And today, he is our high priest who makes intercession for us. He's still carrying us on his shoulders, just like the high priest of Israel did. And if we don't understand the old, you'll never understand that. Jesus is going to preserve you. He's going to carry you before the Lord. At this very moment, he's carrying every believer right before the Almighty. By the way, there's a name for that. I like to mention this at every opportunity. That's eternal security. If I'm, if I'm on the breastplate of the high priest and he's standing before the Lord, that's eternal security. But Jesus prayed for the protection of the believers. Back in verse 11, he asked God the Father to keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me. Now he said, well, that was for the apostles. But you notice, those you now have given me. That's the church. That's every believer he's talking about. And the request is for the preservation, the protection of the believers to protect them with, along with the disciples and continue there with every born again believer in Jesus Christ who ever came to him 2,000 years ago, right up till today, right till that last member of the church comes in. You ever thought about when you witness to someone, that person could be the last member of the church? What would happen when the last member of the church came in? We're going to go up. I don't know how many are left. I'm not setting dates, but you need to have that in mind as you witness to someone. That could be a very, it's always an important person, but if it's the last person to come to the church, the last, boy, what excitement that is. But as believers, we need the protection given by the Lord. We live in a world that's full of hatred. It hates God, it hates His children, everything about God. Even though we don't live in the most dangerous parts of the world, some, of, some missionaries you know, in, in, like in India, those places, it's terrible. The persecution, their, their lives are in danger every moment. We don't live like that. We're, we're blessed but there's still hostility against us. And we must continue with the cause of Christ in our lives. I've said many times, we don't know what persecution is in this country. We feel a little pressure here, a little pressure there. Somebody might mock us, somebody you know, ridicule us. That's not persecution. And yet we cower down. But believers must never retreat. We must never stand still. We must always move forward for Jesus Christ. Every time I say that, it reminds me of General George Patton. Someone said about General Patton's tanks in World War II. So they had five forward gears and no reverse. That's us. We have to move forward, never back up. And to do that, we need the protection that comes only from God. As long as we have something that we need to do, something we have to accomplish for the Lord, He is going to guide us, He's going to protect us, and He's going to embolden us for that mission. We need the protection of the Lord. The second thing Jesus prayed for was the sanctification of the believers. Every believer has been set aside for the purpose of the Lord. He said, everyone, the moment you came to Jesus Christ for salvation, you were set aside. I don't know what you were set, set aside for. I don't, know, maybe, I don't know what I was set aside for completely. May he set me aside to do this. He set you aside to reach this person or that person, but you're set aside for Jesus Christ. That's what sanctification means. You know, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. We're strangers here. We didn't, we're not to live like the world. We must be seen as belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has to see that. Even though we're not of this world, we are still walking in this world. Notice I said we're walking. I didn't say we're living. We're not living here. We live in heaven. That's where we're heading. We're just passing through. We're walking through to get where we belong. But while we're here, we have something to do. You know, we cannot completely remove ourselves from the world. Some people say, you, have to, you can't be involved in the world anymore. That's not what we're talking about here because we're commanded to be witnesses for Jesus both in Jerusalem and 
Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And you cannot do that if you remove yourself from the world. You have to be involved in the world. You don't have to live like the world. You don't, you don't have to be part of that. You know? But you have to be missionaries. Hmm. You're a missionary. Do you know that? Every Christian is to be a missionary. We're to bring the glorious message of the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying people out there. Some people think you can't be a missionary unless you're in Africa or Asia or somewhere like that. You're a missionary. You have people who live next door. You have people you contact with in the store. Friends, relatives. You're a missionary. And your job as being sanctified by God, being set aside, is to be a witness. Remember, missions start at home, right in your own hometown. Jesus said, Jerusalem. You know how Jesus did that? Jerusalem, right here. Judea, the entire southern kingdom. Samaria, the northern kingdom. And the uttermost parts of the earth. You start where you are. And you reach out. That's, that's what our missions is. We start here. We support missions and they go out. We have missionaries that witness here in, you know, in, in Virginia and in the United States and other places. You are a missionary. You are set aside to get that gospel of Jesus Christ out to the world. Thirdly, Jesus prayed for the unity of believers. He prayed in verse 21 that they all may be one. Here's one of those verses, 1721, that is taken out of context, and it's one of the favorite verses to promote the present ecumenical movement. Ecumenicalism, that's basically they say, we don't care what you believe, you don't care what I believe, you just come on in, we're one big happy family, we won't make an issue of doctrine, issue, issues, or anything. that's no problem. Well, we're not going to force our doctrine on you. You don't force it on us. Wow, that's the ecumenical movement. And they call that unity. The truth, though, is the divided church in many ways is a scandal. We should not be divided as we are. We attack one another. But there's a cure. Now listen to me closely. There is a cure, but it's not one of an institutional union. You're not going to get it that way. Our Lord Jesus was not praying for a unity of a single worldwide ecumenical church with full doctrinal heresies and filled with customs. If you want that type of religion, just wait. That's the religious system that's described in Revelation that's headed by the false prophet and the Antichrist. We don't care what you believe. We'll tell you what to believe and Jesus didn't pray for anyone to ignore biblical doctrine. Jesus did not pray for anyone to bend scriptures to say what you wanted to say, which is what these people do. What our Lord was requesting here was a unity of love, a unity of obedience to God and His Word, and a united commitment to do His will. That's the unity Jesus is speaking of here. There's a great difference between uniformity, union, and unity. All believers belong to one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. We're one body. That one baptism he's talking about is not me taking you up here and dunking you under the water. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's unique to the church. The Old Testament saints weren't indwelled by the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit from time to time as needed as we are. But we are indwelt with that Holy Spirit. We are one body in Christ. The spiritual unity of the church is to be manifest in the way you live the way I live. The unity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ desires for His church is the same kind of unity the Son has with the Father. That the Father is in me and I in Him. John 10, 38. The Father did His works 
through the Son, and the Son always did what pleased the Father. John 8, 29. Jesus said, for I do always those things that please Him. You see, that's the pattern the church needs to follow. We as believers in Jesus Christ are to always do what pleases God. That's the unity the church needs. Do what pleases God. Without union with Jesus and the Father, Christians can do absolutely nothing. Nothing. You can make all the plans you want. You can say you're going to do this or you're going to do that. Without that union, we're going to do nothing. You know, Jesus said, I'm the vine, here are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But without me, ye can do nothing. We need to stay in that vine. We need to stay in Jesus Christ. How do we know the will of God? You've got the book on your lap. That's why you cannot ignore the word of God. The goal of every Christian should always be to do the Father's will. The disciples' union with Jesus as his body resulted in the world may know that thou hast sent me. That was their job. We call that witnessing. They knew that God the Father had sent forth the Son. Again, the union of the Christians, that they may be one, is likened to the unity of the Son with the Father, even as we are one. Our will must be God's will. Our life must be entwined with Jesus Christ tightly. This union is further linked with Christ's indwelling of believers, I in them. You know, so often we talk about the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Jesus is there too. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is here with us this morning and He's with you individually and He's with every group of people where two or three are gathered in His name and He's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us right now. He's God. He can be everywhere at one time. Not like the devil. The devil can't be but in one place. He's not God. And the goal of the unity of believers with each other and with God is twofold. First, that the world will believe in the Son's divine mission. That the world may know that thou hast sent me. You know, we live in a world of a lot of gods. In the 2,000 years ago, the Romans had more gods than you could shake a stick at. The Babylonians had many gods. The Egyptians had many gods. The Medes had many gods. Today we have many gods. But the God. The one God sent Jesus Christ. And secondly, that the world would sense that God's love for the believer is deep, it's intimate and lasting as His love for His unique Son. Hath loved them as thou hast loved me. God loves you as He loves His own Son, Jesus Christ. What love is that? It's more than I can comprehend. We need to love each other. As God loves us. And then the fourth thing that Jesus prayed for is the participation in His glory. Jesus stated it clearly in verse 22, And the glory which Thou gavest Me, I have given them. The glory Jesus referred to here is that which He gave the church. Now you're scratching your head. You're talking, what is this glory? If we go back to the first five verses of this prayer, we see that that glory refers to the cross. As the, as the church, the believers, receive the gospel account, and then they meditate over the significance of Jesus' atoning work, then the church will be united in God's purpose and redemptive plan for mankind. In this world, in this life, we have communion with Jesus Christ. We have communion with the Lord. But the communion, like the fellowship with the, the disciples had with Jesus in this life, was different than we had. They had face-to-face -face communion. But I'll tell you something. It's going to increase in eternity. That's the case for every believer. 
We're close to the Lord here. We should be. I know sometimes we move away from Him. He never moves from us. Never. We move away from Him. We get involved in the world. We get involved with this and we slide away. But we can come back in that sweet communion. But in eternity, every believer is going to be closer. It's going to increase. It's going to be what you can't comprehend right now. I want you to give some thought to the wonderment of coming face to face with Jesus Christ and having Jesus Christ in eternal fellowship with you. Have you ever thought about that? That's a long time. And this is what Jesus prayed for in verse 24. Father, then I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Hallelujah. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. What a prayer. Remember I told you earlier that Jesus knew his prayer was going to be accomplished? Let me tell you something, believers. If that's not eternal security, I don't know what is, that the believer will be with where I am. That's heaven. That is wonderful, isn't it? And we can behold his glory. The goal of a believer's salvation is future glorification. And that includes being with Jesus Christ. I have to be honest with you. I've thought many times about that day. What it would be like to see Jesus. In my mind, I have no idea what the Savior looked like on this earth. The closest thing, the closest picture I have to Jesus is not hanging on a wall. I have it in a piece of matzah. That unleavened bread that's pierced and striped, that's the only picture I have of my Savior. But it's going to be different when we see Him face to face. But when I think of that being with Jesus, my thoughts also go to 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God of the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Paul was not expecting a premillennial, pre-tribulation rapture. Then we, he, then we, Paul stop, and then I, he's, I'm looking up. Then we, the word lies, shall be called up. Paul was looking for the rapture at any moment. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Again, that is eternal communion, eternal fellowship. That's eternal security. We shall ever be with the Lord. Doesn't that make you feel confident? Doesn't it make you want to scream and yell hallelujah? I know we're Baptists. We don't do that. But doesn't it make you want to do it? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Colossians 3, 4. Well, the believers are going to appear with Him in glory. What a promise. Being with the Lord Jesus Christ in eternal glory. You ever thought about heaven? We're not told a lot about heaven in Scripture. Told some. If we were told everything about heaven, we'd spend all our time focusing on getting there and we wouldn't be getting the job done. We need to get done. I'll be honest with you. I can't really imagine the glory of heaven. There are going to be colors there I've never seen before. There are going to be things I can't even imagine. Hmm. And I cannot comprehend the glory of being with Jesus. I can't really grasp what it's going to be like to see Jesus and His glory. The one thing I do know is when I see Him, I'm going to fall on my face before Him. If I have any crowns, they're going to be at His feet. But it's wonderful to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ right here and now. But what a wonderful thing to know that it's going to be even sweeter when we have that eternal fellowship with Him. We toss around the word eternal pretty you know, casually. Eternal. It almost appears, though, as we read verse 24, that this is Jesus' last testimony, what we call a will. Did you notice that? 
Jesus says, Father, I will that. The word will is the Greek word thelo, which means to will, to have in mind, to intend, intend to do something. So it's easily seen that Jesus' will was that all born again believers would enter into his glory. We're in Jesus' will. I want all the believers to enter into my glory. I'm going to tell you something. No one's going to cut you out of that will. You're there. Hebrews 2.10 says, For it became him for whom all things, and by whom all are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. The glory was what Jesus had from the Father and would again have. Glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Back in verse 5. That's an important verse for you. Because you need to think about what Jesus gave up. He never gave up being God. But He gave up that glory He had in heaven to come down here to save you and me. Jesus' testament was sealed in His death and resurrection. And let me remind you, never leave Jesus on the cross. That's a picture of unfinished work. And Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. You know, that's the reason I object to the crucifix. He is nailed on that cross forever, but He's not there. Don't ever leave Him on the cross. And don't leave Jesus in that tomb either. If Jesus is still in the tomb, we don't have a living Savior. There's only a dead man. You know, that's where the false religions of the world, they, they can take you to a tomb and say, this is where our leader is. We can take you to a tomb, but He's not there. He's risen. And there's no salvation if Jesus is still in the tomb. Always tell of the resurrection. You know, the Apostle Paul, he talks about the death, burial, and resurrection. He never leaves him on the cross, never leaves him in the tomb. Yes, Jesus died for our sins. That sacrifice was accepted by the Father. How do we know that? How do we know that the Father accepted that sacrifice? Because of the resurrection. If that sacrifice was sufficient, Jesus would never have resurrected. Now, since Jesus' will is identical to the Father's will, everything our Lord prayed for will certainly come to pass. When we pray in the will of the Father, it's going to happen. Jesus' will was the same as God's will. He prayed in that will. It's going to happen. <coughs> Jesus' prayer for believers ends with a call to the righteous Father. The word translated righteous it's an unusual word here for, for John's gospel. It only appears one other time. It's significant though that here is that Jesus prays of the Father. He's praising for His works of revelation. Revealing to Him. Over in, in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I thank Thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. He has revealed through Jesus Christ Himself. He has revealed in Jesus Christ the way of salvation. The Father is righteous. God is right. And the world is wrong. Because Jesus said, The world hath not known me. That's right. The world is wrong. It has rejected God. It has rejected His Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus has known. He's revealed God. He has glorified God the Father. And so should every single Christian. And the essence of God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 John 4.8 he that loveth not knoweth not God. Every time I see Christians despising each other, I have to wonder. When I see Christians who aren't loving each other, I wonder. 
He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Jesus made the Father and His love known to the world by His death. And the Father made known His love for the Son by raising Him to glory. <clears throat> Jesus' purpose in revealing the Father was that Christians would continue to grow in that love. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. And then also to enjoy the personal presence of Jesus Christ in their lives, I in them. Let me recap here. The petitions for the believer are four. Protection. Keep them through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Unity, that they may be one as we are one. And protection and participation in the glory. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me from the foundation of the world. Jesus' prayer is sure to be answered. John 5.14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Jesus always did the will of the Father. He prayed in the will of the Father. That prayer is coming true. As Jesus prayed at the tomb of Lazarus, and I know Thou always hearest me. What an encouraging prayer for us. Think about being protected, sanctified, unified, and participating in the glory of Jesus Christ. But there's only one way to do that. And that is to belong to Jesus Christ, to come to Him for salvation. Without Jesus Christ, this prayer is not for you. You're part of the world. You remember earlier, I don't pray for the world right now. He's praying for the believer. And He is urging you to come right now. Let us pray. Father, I thank You so much for this portion of that prayer. It's encouraging for us to hear our Lord Jesus Christ praying for us. I've seen that protection. I know what that set-aside sanctification is. And I pray for the unity of the church body that we may do the will of God so that that day, glorious day come, we will be with Jesus Christ in glory. But I pray first, Father, for those who may have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that this would be that day. Perhaps they question their salvation. Maybe they're not sure. This is the day to be sure. And I know that we have problems, concerns in this world. Father, help us to turn them over to You. Open our hearts to You and make our requests according to Your will and it will come to pass. Thank You, Father, for those who have been with us this morning. I pray the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts and their lives right now, encouraging and strengthening, lifting us up. And we give You the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right.